Here we go. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we're going to examine the scientific approach to trading and to market analysis and to technical analysis. With me is David Aronson. David is the author of this classic book called Evidence-Based Technical Analysis, and he's also the author of another new book called Statistically Sound Machine Learning for Algorithmic Trading of Financial Instruments. David is a former adjunct professor at Baruch College School of Business in New York. He's also a former proprietary trader with Spear, Leeds, and Kellogg, one of the largest trading firms in the country. Now, as I understand, it's part of Goldman Sachs. Welcome, David. Now, machine learning is a very broad term. Uh, there are many approaches to machine learning, neural networks, support vector machines. Uh, there are many exotic things. In fact, even in the area of neural networks, there are dozens of different types. Um, can, can you give me something of an overview? In fact, let's, let's start here because there are several types of machine learning built right into your TSSB system, and there are some that are excluded. So can we talk about that Yeah, um, from an overview perspective? What all statistical modeling or machine learning methods attempt to do uh, uh, in, the, in the context of prediction is to come up with a prediction function. Uh, to come up with a relationship between some set of indicators or predictor variables and a variable you're interested in predicting. The so target. The target variable or the dependent variable in, in statistical jargon. So they all try to, they're all trying to solve that problem in one way or another with slight variations. Uh, multiple linear regression is the oldest in, uh, method for doing that and um, some people say well that doesn't constitute machine learning and some people would say it, it does but that's definitional. It's still trying to do the same thing given the constraints of how that method is designed. Um, Within the last, say, 30 years, computers became powerful enough to relax some of the fixed assumptions of multiple regression analysis and allow the machine to find relationships that are not linear, these non-parametric and non-linear methods. But it's still trying to find that function that represents, that, that relates the predictor variables to the target variable. It's still That's the a common problem. thread across all of them. That's the common thread. Mm -hmm. um, and many of these different methods that go by different names are not all that different. Uh, they, they're slight differences, but they're, they all belong to the same family of mathematical techniques of trying to fit a function to data. Mm -hmm. And um, neural networks is one way to do it. Uh, support vector machines are actually can be seen as a type of a neural network. Um, that uses something called a, rate, a, a certain type of basis function. Um, without getting into the details of that, uh, when you get down to the mathematics of what's really going on, there, there are really great similarities. Mm -hmm. um, the support vector machine, was, uh, which was proposed about 20 years ago, was supposed to be a big breakthrough because it was the first uh, data mining technique or machine learning technique that was derived from theory. Up to that point, all the different methods were cobbled together heuristically. Like it looks like this thing works, so let's let's go with it. But but by 1990, the this activity had been around long enough that mathematicians started to theorize about how statistical learning occurs. And that one mathematician in particular, a man named Vapnik, came up with a theory of machine learning. And on the basis of that theory, he said, well the most efficient way to go about that is to do something that he called the support vector machine. And so there was a great deal of fanfare about it because everybody thought, hey, we finally now have a theory for explaining how machines learn st uh, statistically, and here's the best method that comes out of that mathematical theory. And it's a fine method, but it's not demonstrably superior on certain problems to some of the older methods. 
So in certain cases, it's very good. In other cases, uh, plain old linear regression will work better simply because uh, uh, support vector machines tend to overfit the data. Mm -hmm. to so there is no one magical tool out there, and that's why in our software we have probably maybe 10 different methods in there, everything from multiple linear regression to uh, a very powerful technique called generalized regression networks to neural networks that work in both the um, the ordinary domain and in the complex number domain we have trees and decision tree forests and boosted trees and things called split linear models and operation string models which are a variant of genetic programming so we've got a bunch of different tools in there um, in including some that combine uh, I understand well once you get past uh, different uh, machine learning paradigms then you're in a position to develop what they call uh, model ensembles or committees where you might have a dozen models and then you form a prediction by combining all of the models predictions in some fashion it could be just something as simple as averaging them or it could be something more sophisticated there are many different types of voting techniques right voting techniques exactly mm -hmm. uh, so th that's another wrinkle on this whole process is uh, in, in the old days which is not that long ago, uh, people would say, well, I'm going to come up with the best single model and I can come up with and that's that. But then it was discovered that different models have different strengths and weaknesses, so let's combine their predictions and you can get a pretty significant boost in predictive power just by combining predictions into a, an ensemble or committee, as they're called. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's been a, a trend in, in modeling in recent years. Another uh, important distinction I think it's worth talking about is the difference between uh, a structured learning uh, environment and, and a learning environment that deals with unstructured data like tweets, blogs, news items. Well, this, this is one of the most exciting areas in machine learning and artificial intelligence is conferring on a machine the ability to learn from unstructured data because it's said that 80% of the data in the world uh, is unstructured. And by structured data, I mean a table of numbers that looks like a spreadsheet, mm -hmm. columns and rows of numbers. Like and a price chart, a daily, daily prices or hourly prices. Or yes, if it's, if it's in a spreadsheet, if it's numerical data in a spreadsheet, mm -hmm. that's structured data. But when you start look, considering things like video and audio and written text uh, and spoken text, uh, these are, this is unstructured data and learning from it is, is, is quite a challenge and this is one of the really uh, new areas going on in machine learning. Uh, having computers read the news and trying to discern what the sentiment uh, is behind a particular news article or a particular blog or tweet. Mm -hmm. Or uh, some interesting research I've come up uh, upon recently is looking at particular bloggers and particular tweeters and trying to determine which amongst these are, are the experts. And yes, mm -hmm. that, that would be great uh, to figure out who really knows. And those are people whose sentiment that you'd want to follow. Uh, historically, people say, well, if everybody's bullish, I want to do the opposite. But maybe there's certain people who really know and when they're bullish, I should be bullish. Yeah, I've also uh, seen articles proposing uh, that research start to look at voice analysis of uh, CEOs when they you know, do their conference calls. Well, they might they might be giving off some subtle cues there too. Yes. Yeah. Voice stress analysis. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you. I I'm assuming that. Uh, Dealing with unstructured data is a step beyond what what you have available in this book. Correct. Uh, the TSSB software deals only with structured data. Um, there isn't exactly a hard division because recently one of the originators of uh, one of the firms that generate sentiment data from unstructured data, they ultimately do put it into a structured format that, that can be processed by our software. Mm -hmm. So we've done some research on some of these, um, uh, 
let's call it machine derived sentiment factors uh, yeah. that come from reading news and, and, and blogs and so on. That, that's right. Companies like Thomson Reuters and, and Ravenpack will provide machine readable uh, sentiment analysis and, and they do it very rapidly within um, probably less than a second from the time uh, these news stories hit the wires. I'm not familiar with the Raven. I know of Ravenpack. I've never looked at their data, but yes, uh, it's very exciting what's going on there. Mm -hmm. So, do you have a vision for uh, the future of uh, algorithmic trading? I think machines are going to continue to get smarter um, and um, efficiencies in the market are going to be gradually eradicated as more and more people adopt these approaches. Yeah. And for the economy, this is a good thing. Ultimately, for traders, it may not be such a good thing. It's like when the gold gets mined out of a given territory, you know, when you've got better tools for getting the gold out of the ground, pretty soon there's no gold left. Um, so the opportunities may be in less developed markets, like emerging markets. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole discipline of behavioral finance that suggests that uh, uh, there are certain foibles to the human mind that uh, yeah. influence it. People tend to overreact or underreact to news, or they need time to digest the news or to determine uh, what the implications are when other institutions and other traders uh, act on the news. So it's, it's as if the market is always changing and evolving. Uh, it strikes me that the market itself is something of an evolutionary process. That's true. Uh, um, Professor Andrew Lowe from MIT has written a very interesting paper called the Adaptive Market Hypothesis. The market's a moving target that's always changing uh, based on the context. So it's entirely possible that my future where there are no opportunities could, could be wrong and that the market will evolve in a way that um, maybe the pockets of opportunity at the high frequency level will disappear, but it'll create distortions and opportunities at some other time scale. Mm -hmm. And that, that makes a lot of sense, I think. I think that the market is going to be a moving process, and I think it was George Soros who had this theory of reflexivity. He said that you, you can never master the market because it's always responding to who we are, and even if the machines are driving the market, it's going to respond in a way that's going to create effects that even the machines can't anticipate. Mm -hmm. Now, I have one other um, point I'd like to bring up with you, and that is uh, we know these days that uh, I think approximately 70% of all the uh, trades on the NASDAQ market, the New York Stock Exchange, are, are algorithmic. They're high-frequency trades issued. I don't. I think maybe only a dozen or two dozen companies are really working with these low latency, high frequency systems. They're in and out of the market in a matter of seconds. Uh, and I've heard many traders express the notion that they're not really trading based on, uh, on knowledge of financial uh, market principles so much as they are trading based on uh, what would be the term I'm looking for loopholes in the rules themselves uh, that that allow them to for example jump ahead of other traders in in the line or take advantage of, of uh, some rules uh, that are really unfair to other traders do you, do you have an opinion on that or is that a concern of yours um, well, I'm certainly not competing in that area, and I, I'd say that it's probably an area that I don't know that much about. I've, I've heard these same expressions of concern, and I don't really have any uh, exceptional knowledge about that aspect of trading. Your TSSB system is, is not designed to help anybody build systems of that type. Well, it's indifferent to the time scale of the data. It can deal with data down to the one second level, but um, I well, I guess if it, we could make it so it would deal with millisecond data, um, whether it could find something there or not, yeah. uh, I don't know. But but it's it's indifferent to the time scale of the data. As long as it can be put into to a structured format, we can 
theoretically mm. try to learn from. Oh, okay. And, and so, in other words, it also would be indifferent to the trading hypothesis. Yes. Oh, absolutely. It, mm -hmm. No, it, it has no orthodoxy doctrines or religion of its own whatsoever. It's, mm -hmm. It takes the data and it, and it starts exploring it on its own. So, if, if some... Uh, clever trader were to find a weakness in the trading rules themselves and wanted to exploit those rules, in theory your system might work as well as any other for that purpose. Yeah. Yeah. If there's if there's some exploitable predictive effect, because that's what the software looks for. It's looking for predictive effects. Is there a set of antecedent conditions that has a non random association with some outcome that we can we can trade? Mm -hmm. Well, David Aronson, it's been a pleasure spending this time with you, reviewing uh, the work that you've done. I, as I mentioned in the beginning of our discussion, I'm a big admirer of your work and your insistence on trying to take uh, technical analysis and trading in general uh, more and more into the realm of uh, empirical science. Uh, are there any final thoughts you have before we uh, end our interview? Well, I've really enjoyed the interview, Jeff, and I uh, appreciate the opportunity of being here with you. Well, thank you very much. I look forward to uh, having another opportunity as well. Same here. Thank you, Jeff.